It must not have been on all the way. No. The light was on, but nobody was home. <laughs> I think it's fine now. Thank you, sir. All right, well, anyway, let's, let's take a few moments, take a deep breath, and uh, get ready to take in the Word of God. All right? Well, Father, tonight, we thank you so much for your grace to us, and thank you for the opportunity we have to assemble together in freedom. We know that this is compliments to us from your grace, and the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ continues to control history. Tonight, as we approach your word, we realize that our nation is struggling right now. We know that Satan is about his agenda and we pray that God the Holy Spirit will be able to take your word and challenge us with it, cause us to advance in our spiritual life so that we might become part of the preserving factor of Client Nation America. So as we approach your word, may God the Holy Spirit sanctify these things to the nourishment of our souls. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. With all that's going on around us today, and you know there's a lot going on around us today, in our own nation, the nation of Israel, and yes, all over the world, as a matter of fact. It's like the world is about ready to be on fire, seems like, in so many areas. It reminds me <clears throat> a little bit of what our Lord Jesus Christ told the disciples when he was on the Mount of Olives with them. Of course, he was talking about the tribulation, but he told them this. This is in Matthew chapter uh, 24, if you want to turn there right quick. In Matthew chapter 24, he met with the disciples on the Mount of Olives. He described for them the first half of the tribulation. The first half of the tribulation is described in verses 1 through 8 of Matthew 24. It says, in Jesus, this is verse 1, and Jesus came out of the temple and was going away with his disciples, and came to a point, and he came up and to point the temple building to him. And they were awed, by, of course, by the temple building. And he answered and said to them, <clears throat> excuse me, do you not see all of these things? Well, truly I say to you, not one stone here should be left upon another which will not be torn down. I'm sure that set them back on their heels a little bit. And then while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, are they going to ask three questions? Question number one, when will these things be? He's just told them that not a stone's going to be left. When is this, when will these things be? Then, he, then they asked, what shall be the sign of your coming? And thirdly, third question, and the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Many will be misled, and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all of these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. He had warned them that they, was going, they were going to observe something that would be coming down the pike. Of course, the nation of Israel will during the tribulation. But these are things that are going to continue even in the time in which we live in the church age. We are hearing of wars and rumors of wars. But you know, what I took out of this is when he told them, listen, you're going to hear these things, but don't be frightened. God has a plan. God isn't taken by surprise as to what happens in the world. As the heathen rage, continue to rage, often as they plan their schemes, often God just sits and laughs at their schemes. Uh, no, no, I'm not telling you that 
uh, we're in the first part of the tribulation. So please don't say Pete. You know what Pete taught the other night? He taught that we're in the first three years of the tribulation. No, no, I'm not teaching that. I'm just telling you that what we're seeing today may be a precursor of what our Lord was talking about when he was talking to the disciples. Of course, I believe that the rapture has to take place, the snatching away, the promise that has been given to the church, the snatching away of the church will take place first. First Thess- uh, Second Thessalonians, uh, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, gives us that word harpazo. We're going to be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds, with the other believers, the royal family of God, to meet the Lord in the air. Then the first half of the tribulation will take place. So that's my stance anyway. However, that does not mean that we may not see some of the uh, similar things that are going to be taking place during that particular time. Uh, beginning at the beginning of the tribulation, how much of the rearranging of the furniture on the stage we will see, uh, no one knows for sure. The props on the stage must be uh, put in their correct place. And how much we'll see that before we exit, uh, before the curtain goes up, the final scene of the present age of Israel comes to a close, we do not know. That is the seven years of tribulation following the rapture of the church. How much of that, the, the beginning of that, we do not know. Will we see a temple? Will we? We don't know. And it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Because only God himself knows. He has reserved that information for himself to be revealed later on. This is what the disciples were told by our Lord in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7. No one knows when all of these things are going to take place. There is nothing that we can point to to say that the rapture is going to take place at, in an hour, a day, a hundred years. We have no idea. All we know is the promise that he's given us. In the meantime, in the meantime, when all of the things you see happening all over the world, especially whenever it happens in Israel, then the prophecy buffs are scratching their prophecy bumps. Because what they're trying to do, they're trying to fit the rapture, the king of the north, Ezekiel 38 battle, uh, the events of Armageddon, the Antichrist, and it depends on which group you're listening to or following or studying behind or whatever, as to how far they will go with these things. But the principle is in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord says, listen, no one knows this except the Father. It's not given to us to know the seasons and the times. The Father has rever- re- reserved this for himself. All right, so, in the meantime, in the meantime, you and I are here. The fact is, what God expects us to do. This is the issue tonight. What does God want us, the royal family of God, the church, to do? While we see all of the things happening, and we don't know how far this is, are we going to see? I grew up under the fact, well, we can't, there'll never be a World War III. We just, the world won't stand it. Well, I don't necessarily believe that. We could very well have a World War III. Will we? I do not know. All I know is, when God has left, since God has left us here, then he has given us a mission. And so the fact is that God wants us, royal family of God, to continue to be the resistance force against Satan's evil, against his evil schemes. Uh, His desire is to launch his global initiative to take over and rule the world. And the only thing that is standing in the way Well, that's you. You're standing in his way. I'm standing in his way. The church is standing in his way. And so therefore, when we're here, God wants us to make sure that we can make an effective stand where we are, where we live, the part of the royal family of God that belongs to us. We are to stand firm for the word of God. So we are part of that resistance force that God has given us. We're to stand firm, resist his evil, by means of God the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that He has given us. Ephesians chapter 6, James chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 5, you can read those. It talks about the fact that you are a resistance force 
against Satan. And you and I are to stand firm against Satan's schemes. He has one agenda, and that agenda is to take over and to rule the world. And you and I, and the rest of the church, stand in his way. So remember, the church itself remains a viable force of resistance as long as it remains on the earth because of the presence of God the Holy Spirit. The presence of God the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, uh, now when that's gone, then Satan will be able to move more freely. His parameters will expand. Right now, the parameters of Satan's activity is limited because of the activity of the royal family of God in the church. And so when the church begins, when the pivot of the church, when the core of the church begins to shrink, you can see how that the parameters of Satan began to expand. Notice in our own nation, just the last 10 years, if you can go back to 20 years, you can see how the parameters of evil have expanded in our country. So that Satan now is opposing the truth in so many areas of our lives. And he has actually attacked the truth. And he is actually trying to take the truth out. He wants to suppress that truth and exchange that truth. And then he's going to openly oppose that truth. That's his three basic methods. And that's what he's doing. So remember, and never underestimate the effectiveness of your spiritual life in the angelic conflict. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the humdrum of day, the humdrum of work, the humdrum of this, the humdrum of that. Just go through the motions. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that you and I have been left here for a reason. You and I have been left here for a purpose. And that purpose is to stand in for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not here personally. He's at the right hand of God the Father. But we have been left here to stand in for him while we are awaiting his return. And so while we're waiting for his return, then we should be challenged to be moving in our spiritual life, to have spiritual momentum in our spiritual life, to help curb and resist uh, Satan's evil intent. All right, so when the church is gone, then of course uh, Satan will be able to expand his parameters. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians. If you want to turn there, you can. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, very quickly. Paul said this to them, because he had already taught them these things. So he said, you know, you know what restrains him, that is, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness. You know what restrains him. Now you notice uh, when it says what? Well, that's neuter. That is a reference to the church. You know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, now it becomes masculine. Now he, who now restrains, will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Paul is talking about the what, that's the church. The He is the Holy Spirit who indwells every member of the church. This provides the resistance force against Satan being able to open up the floodgates to bring his man on the scene in order to bring about his agenda of a one world and global government, economically, religious, etc. All right, so again, Paul says, only he who now restrains will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. That's the rapture. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That's the second coming. That's at the end of the seven years of tribulation. All right, so what? (laughs) So what? So what is to be our attitude? What is to be our approach? What is to be our action during these challenging times in which we live? And during these times when we're waiting for that blessed hope, we're waiting for that living hope, we're waiting for that purifying hope of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So are we just to be here marking time, or what should we be doing? What does God expect for us? Well, you know, there are a lot of phrases that we use. 
We pick up a lot of phrases as we go along with reference to what the believer should be doing. Uh, maybe you remember this one, or maybe you know this one uh, from the film, uh, what was it called? Finding Nebo, I think it was. Just keep swimming. <laughs> just keep swimming. You probably heard that, right? But I think God says, look, guys, just keep swimming. <laughs> keep your momentum going. Don't get dead in the water. Keep your momentum going. Keep swimming. Or we say one popular one, keep on keeping on. You've heard that one. Keep on keeping on. Well, I think that's exactly what God says. Look, guys, keep on keeping on. Don't be afraid. Don't be frightened. Hey, I anticipated this in eternity past. Just keep on keeping on. Just keep on swimming. Or, how about this one? Stick to your knitting. <laughs> Stick to your knitting. You know. Or maybe you have a favorite one. You can use that one. You can share it with me afterwards if you like. But we have phrases to describe exactly what God wants us to do. To keep on keeping on. In the spiritual life. Learning the spiritual life. Learning to live that spiritual life. And then maintaining spiritual momentum by living that spiritual life. Now, in order to do this effectively, we must maintain the correct mental attitude. So what Satan wants to do, he wants to destroy your mental attitude. <laughs> he wants to get you, you know, by your emotions. He wants to take you and just r rag you out with your emotions. Uh, as you face difficulties and adversities and situations, circum disappointments, whatever it is you have to face, Satan wants you to, to be able to be, for him to be able to uh, cause you to be frightened, cause you to be disappointed, cause you to be so frustrated, cause you to give up, throw up your hands and quit. Whatever it takes, it doesn't matter to him what it takes. He doesn't care how you do it or what it takes to do it. He just wants to neutralize you in your spiritual life. That's all he cares about. He doesn't care about anything else. Because he knows that if, you, if, he, if he can neutralize you, and then he can neutralize me, and then he can neutralize another one, and then he can neutralize another one, guess what? He can begin to expand his parameters again. Because that's his whole agenda. In destroying a client nation, if you have a, long, a strong pivot of believers, then it's hard for Satan to expand his parameters. But when that pivot begins to shrink, and the strength of that pivot begins to wane, Satan, of course, takes advantage. This is why Paul says, look, don't give the devil an opportunity. Why won't you give the devil an opportunity? Because he'll take it. You give him an opportunity, he'll take it. He'll take anything he can. So, in order to do the effective job that God wants us to do. We must maintain the correct mental attitude so that we can maintain our spiritual momentum. That's the key to your spiritual life. The key to your spiritual life is maintaining your momentum, maintaining momentum uh, mental attitude. The mental attitude that God wants you to have as you face life on a daily basis. All right, so... With all that said, go to Philippians 3. Go to Philippians chapter 3. I entitled this, Momentum Mentality. Momentum Mentality. All right, we'll begin Philippians 3 and verse 12. That's where we'll start. Paul says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. Brethren, verse, 11, uh, verse 13 says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Notice the next verse. I press on. I press on. I keep on swimming. <laughs> I stick to my knitting. I press on toward the goal 
for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a phenomenal passage. This is uh, just these short verses here, these three verses. As a matter of fact, they're based upon, obviously, what has what uh, found previously in the verses ahead. This section is based upon the understanding of the previous verses where Paul draws a contrast for us between worldly advantages and spiritual advantages. See, Satan always wants us to be occupied with the worldly advantages so that the spiritual advantages can grow dim. He doesn't want the spiritual advantages to be shining bright. He doesn't want that to be your priority and your pursuit in life. No, he would rather for you to pursue the worldly advantages. You live in the world, have to deal with the world, and so therefore he wants to use the things of the world, which by the way are legitimate things uh, in some cases. Some of this that Paul gives here are not legitimate. But Satan can use the details of life, and, they're de- and they are very legitimate things. But Satan will, wants you to become so occupied with the details of life the legitimate things in life, relationships, jobs, family, all sorts of these are uh, wealth. These are legitimate things. There's nothing wrong with any of them. But when they become priority, when they become the pursuit of your life rather than the spiritual life, and you begin to have to uh, organize your spiritual life around your worldly advantages, then you can get yourself in trouble. God doesn't play second fiddle. Now, the worldly advantages are found in verses 5 and 6. Now, Paul had his worldly advantages. This is before he became a believer, by the way. So back up a few verses. Verse 5, he says about this about himself. Circumcised the eighth day. Then he says, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the, as to the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Those were Paul's worldly advantages. Uh, he said, circumcised the eighth day. Well, he had, that's religious legalism. He was caught up in religious legalism. And they, the nation of Israel, he said, this is the, uh, he was related in the, he was related to Abraham, the nation of Israel, the Jews, came from Abraham. And so he was in the line, he was in the line of Abraham. Uh, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, family influence. You remember the very first king of Israel was from what tribe? Benjamin. Saul was a Benjamite. Of course, he lost it because, you know, he went into reversionism and died to sin unto death eventually, and David took over. And so therefore it shifted from Benjamin to Judah. But being from the tribe of Benjamin, and they were great warriors, uh, a lot of family heritage there. So there was a lot of family influence and prestige. Hebrew of the Hebrews, national prestige. A Pharisee, a religious position. Religious zeal, he, so much religious zeal, he became a persecutor of the church. And as far as his human righteousness is concerned, before the law, he says he was blameless. He was eaten up with self-righteousness and arrogance. So from a world perspective, you look at this guy, he had a lot of advantages going for him. That's why he was chosen to do what he, you know, he was voted the most likely to succeed in his graduating class, and he did. I mean, he was voted it, so he did. That was Paul. But then, Paul became more willing to forfeit these worldly advantages for the spiritual advantages that he would find in Christ. This is why in verse 7, he goes on to say, but whatsoever things were gained to me, Whatever things were advantage to me, those things I have counted as nothing, as loss, for the sake of Christ. You know, often those things 
that are advantages in the world become a detriment to the spiritual life. We have to be careful of worldly advantages, that they do not interfere with the spiritual advantages. Where are the spiritual advantages? Here they are, verses 8 through 11. Take a look at them. More than that, we just read verse 7, more than that, verse 8 says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the exit resurrection or the resurrection out from among the dead. So we had seven worldly advantages he listed for us. Now we have seven spiritual advantages he lists for us. Gain Christ. What did he do? He gained Christ. This is the eternal abundant life that's found in Jesus Christ. Our Lord said, listen, I've come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. When you receive Christ as your Savior, guess what? You get an eternal life package which includes the availability of an abundant life. The life that is really life. A life that can take you beyond your dreams. That's the life that Christ came to give. And so therefore, how do you, when you gain Christ, you gain His life. His life being lived through you. That's the abundant life. So, in contrast, Paul says, listen, the eternal life, the abundant life, uh, both free gifts through faith. And then, Secondly, found in him. Found in him, Paul says. This is the royal family of God's unique position, sharing everything that had been given to the humanity of Christ. Don't let that slip from your thoughts. Understand that. God the Father has given to you everything that he gave to the humanity of his Son. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ was the trailblazer he was the perfecter of faith, the perfecter of doctrine. He finished the work that God sent him to do. And so he lived the spiritual life, and now he has passed on to you and to me how to live that spiritual life by means of the spiritual assets that God the Father gave him. So found in him, in him is positional truth, where we receive everything that we need for this life and for the one to come. A righteousness from God is number three. This is imputed righteousness. Righteousness imputed by grace. Why is that important? Well, he, he contrasted in the worldly advantages his own righteousness. Well, you know what the Word of God says. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. This righteousness is given to him on the basis of faith. Imputed by grace. Because you see, now that righteousness is acceptable to God. Remember, the only thing that that God will ever accept from you is that which he has given you first. Now, God has given you volition. God expects you to use your volition to either accept or reject Jesus Christ. And so when God wants to bless you, he wants you to utilize his assets. Let God the Holy Spirit work in you to willing to do of God's good pleasure. Then God will accept that. See, God can only accept what God does because God can only accept that which is perfect. And God is the only one who can do that which is perfect. That's the key to the spiritual life and why. When Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's what God the Father accepts in your life, in my life. What he produces is what he accepts. What he produces is what he will reward. This is why the contrast between human righteousness, human good, and divine righteousness is so important in the scriptures and to understand. I right, saw so righteousness from God, a righteousness that God can accept. It's a righteousness that God himself gives you and a righteousness that he can produce in you by means 
of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. All right? To know Him. This is number four. This is maximum virtue love. Occupation with the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the ultimate problem-solving device for your life. Your occupation with our Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing Christ in the sense of personal love for Him. Personal love for God the Father. Personal love and, and occupation with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's knowing Him. And this, of course, is the, is the ultimate problem-solving device that God has provided for us as we face all of the contingencies of life. We're to be occupied with our Lord. That is, how did He handle this situation? How did He face the opposition? What was His attitude? What was His action? Well, we know this, of course, from the Word of God. And so, therefore, God the Holy Spirit produces the life of Christ in us by means of the Word of God, resident, circulating in our stream of consciousness. That's what He uses in order to produce Christ in us. That's how we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way. That's what Paul said. Put on Christ. How do you put on Christ? Well, as you walk in the Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God, and He brings it to your remembrance, gives you opportunity uh, in a certain situation to use that, which reflects the character of Christ, the, unfor unfor the unconditional love, the un conditional forgiveness in this particular situation. The person certainly didn't earn it nor deserve it, but you gave it to them anyway with the right attitude because you have a love for them and you love the Lord Jesus Christ. And you love God the Father and you know that this is the attitude that you should have. And God the Holy Spirit will bring that to your remembrance if you are filled with the Spirit. And so this is knowing Him. Then that divine power that He mentioned. Divine power. Can execute, this is where you can execute the spiritual life through the divine power that God has given you. The two power options, and you've probably heard this before. The two power options. God the Holy Spirit is the agent of God's power in your life. And the Word of God is the source. The agent always uses the source. And so this is why it's so important to have the Word of God continually coming in and circulating in the stream of consciousness. So the agent of God's power can put it to work in your life, the Holy Spirit. The fellowship of his sufferings was another spiritual advantage. This is standing in for the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, and facing uh, the rejection and the opposition. Uh, the Lord warned the disciples. He told them, you're going to face opposition. Uh, you're going to face rejection. You're going to face hostility. Of course, he goes on in some passage and tells them you're going to face death. Some of them would. But you see, it says, fellowship of his sufferings, meaning suffering undeservedly. We have an opportunity as a resistance force to stand in for our Lord Jesus Christ and have to put up with and have to deal with, have to face often undeserved suffering, just like our Lord Jesus Christ did. And so he gives us the privilege and the opportunity. It's the greatest thing, Peter says, it's the greatest thing that your faith will ever face. It's the suffering that you face for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his sake, for his sake, for his sake. Not for your sake, but for his sake. That's the greatest privilege that we have to stand in for our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the resurrection he mentions, the number seven. This is the ultimate spiritual victory. A glorious body likened into that of our Lord Jesus Christ, receiving that resurrection body. So when you say, Paul said, look, here were my worldly advantages. Now turn over here. Here are my spiritual advantages. Compare them yourself. <laughs> Which would you prefer to have? The worldly advantages or the spiritual advantages? Well, I'm afraid sometimes in some manner, in some ways, we choose the worldly advantages rather than the spiritual advantages. All right, back to chat, uh, verses 12 through 14. We have four steps. Four steps in spiritual momentum. Four steps in maintaining spiritual momentum mentality. The way you should think. Four things. I'm sorry. I usually try to give three, but Somehow Paul put four in here. So 
we'll have to deal with four. Now, again, we'll read it. Not that I have already obtained it, I've already become perfect, but I, number one, press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as to having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, this is number two, forgetting what lies behind. And number three, reaching forward to what lies ahead. And number four, uh, number four in verse 14, and I press on toward the goal of the prize of their upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Maintaining spiritual momentum mentality. Press on, he says. The Greek word here means to, to press forward, uh, to pursue. Uh, this is a metaphor, actually, uh, taken from the Olympic Games. It's the runner, the sprinter uh, that Paul has in mind here. He's running a race, and so Paul uses this. Uh, a metaphor from the a foot race of the Olympic Games. Uh, like in Philippians chapter 2, 16. Philippians 2, verse 16. Holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may not have I may have cause to glory, I may have cause to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. In other words, I ran the race. I ran the race. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, Paul wrote, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? So here, now, please don't think that you're running against other Christians. You're not running against other Christians. You're in this race, your own personal race, is what Paul is dealing with in this passage. So he says to you and to me, to run your race, in continuing in this verse. But only one receives the prize. So therefore, run in such a way that you may win. Run in such a way that you may win. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul said this. This is his last letter, the letter from death row. I fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Those are some of his last words that he wrote down for us. The writer of the Hebrews, of course, one that you're, I'm sure, very familiar with, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, that which trips us up, that which distorts our run, interferes with our run. Let's lay aside every encumbrance and the sin, which I think in context of Hebrews is the sin of unbelief. And the sin which so easily entangles us, and then so let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's the challenge. So what did Paul say with reference to this? I press on. I keep on running. Paul's desire was to make it to the rapture. That was his desire. That would mean that he had finished the job or the course that the Lord had given him. It would mean that he would receive a resurrection body and that he was in a state of completion or perfection uh, through ultimate sanctification, the resurrection body. However, he states the obvious in the context, that up to this point in time, this had not yet occurred. So therefore, in the meantime, what does he say? He continues to pursue the goal or the objective for which the Lord had apprehended him to finish the course. Keep on keeping on until the course is finished. Making a maximum impact for our Lord Jesus Christ through the reaching of the super grace life in spiritual maturity. Paul kept on and on in the spiritual life. He kept pressing on. And then in verse 13 he says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, and this I think was very meaningful for the Apostle Paul, forgetting what lies behind 
and reaching forward to what lies ahead. The word for getting here is in the present is, is a present participle. So keep on doing this. This is something that you keep on. I keep on forgetting. I keep on putting out of my mind. I keep on. Uh, Paul here is sticking with the race uh, of the language, uh, the the race course, the running. When you think about a runner, when he takes off, what's the first thing he does? He takes off and then he turns around to see who's following him. Right? No, he doesn't do that. Because you don't look behind you when you're running a race, when you're sprinting, because it throws you off, throws your stride off, and slows you down. And guess what? You could lose the race. So you don't look behind you. You stay forward, looking forward to the goal. So he says, listen, I keep on running straight on. I don't look behind me. He leaves behind the early stages of the race. Uh, some of it was good, some of it was bad, and some of it was even ugly. But when you're out there running the race, you're not constantly looking around and saying, boy, I was doing cross country. Golly, I remember, oh, way back yonder when I ran around that curve and I slipped a little bit, you know. Uh, you don't do that. You keep on, your eyes on the go, and keep moving forward. And so this is what Paul is saying. Leaves behind the earlier stages of the race, regardless, regardless of what they contain, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He can't allow past events or situations to distract him from his objective, from the goal. So therefore, he keeps his eye straight ahead, on the finish line. He can't afford to concentrate on his last failed attempt at racing. He can't concentrate on his fall, his stepping out of bounds, being interfered with, his lack of form, his losing stride. You can just go on and on and on. But you see, the reason I point this out is because this is often is what we do. We look back at these things in our own life rather than just advancing forward, moving forward, forgetting those things that are behind. No need to be dragging those dead bodies along with you. You can't do that. So wherever we are, God takes us where we are, and we move on toward the goal of fulfilling the objective of the, which God has given to us to, do, to perform. So, for the royal family of God, this is analogous to what we call rebound, confession of sin, and keep moving. Rebound and keep moving. David had to do it. Paul had to do it. All, every believer has to do it. You can't afford not to do it. You have to accept that forgiveness provided, for our Lord Je- provided by our Lord Jesus Christ. You just have to keep stretching forward, moving forward. Keep moving with renewed enthusiasm and determination, as the next command, by the way, or the next uh, uh, one, number three, reaching forward, gives us. This word, another present middle participle, by the way, keep on doing this. To stretch one's self forward is what it means. Reaching forward means to stretch forward. Move yourself forward. Again, using the race metaphor, the runner is stretching himself forward as much as possible as his mind, uh, mind's concentration forces all of his energy into a final effort to win the race. Sometimes it gets right down to just stretching forward in the race. Focus and stride and determination. How many of you ever saw the movie Chariots of Fire? You remember what? You remember something kind of unique about Eric Little? As he was approaching, just as he was approaching the tape, what would he do? I didn't like the part about his arms. but, (laughs) But he always lifted his head up like this as he went forward. It was it was his trait. Just about every time he ran, that's what he would do. His his concentration, I think, was so fantastic. 
He was concentrating on his stride. He was concentrating on the goal. And so he moved, and so he lifted his head as he was stretching forward. That's the way we should be running the race toward that goal in our own life spiritually. Moving forward, stretching forward. This means, of course, hey, you're going to face adversities, you're going to face difficulties, you're going to face all sorts of things. But get in stride. Focus on the goal. Concentrate. Be occupied with our Lord Jesus Christ. The focus, the stride, and the determination to honor our Lord Jesus Christ, to live for Him, to walk in a manner that would be worthy of Him. So in life, in the race that we face, focus, stride, and determination. Keep on keeping on. So what does He say He does in verse 14? I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It literally says he presses on toward the mark. He presses on toward the mark. Now Paul states that he, uh, that he presses on, he pursues like a runner toward the goal or the mark, the finish line, the objective of the course, the culmination of all the training, the culmination of all the hard work to finish the race and to win the race. So he's given quite a challenge to these believers in Philippi. For as he presses on in the race, that which awaits those, of course, the prize. The prize is what waits those who run the race. This is why Paul says, run your race in such a way that you can win that race. What is the prize? Well, Paul calls it something here. He calls it that which is the high calling of God. Have you ever thought about that? What is the high calling of God? Here we are. You got up today. You may have turned your TV on if you could stand it or not, but you may have turned it on to watch what was going on and all the nonsense and the chaos that's going on to find out, you know, how how stupid today our politicians are going to be. I mean, I don't know. get kind of tired of finding that out maybe. But in the midst of all that is going on around us, and especially in our nation, what is the high calling of God for us? The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That is finishing the course. The high call is to finish the course. To receive, remember, to receive the goal. (laughs) That was always the objective. The Olympics. To receive the goal. Well, that's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. The, finish the course and get that gold, that silver, the precious stones. This is what God has ahead for you if you will allow Him to work in your life. If you will use the assets and do the training on the basis of what God has given to you in the spiritual life so that He can work in your life so that you can finish the course, so that you can reach that high calling God of God. Receiving the gold, the silver, and the precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ. There's a crown of righteousness there. There's a crown of joy there. There's a crown of glory there. And God wants you to have these things as, as you allow Him to work in your life. These things become possible for you to receive at the judgment seat of Christ. This is why Paul says, keep on keeping on. Don't get off your stride. Don't look behind you. Don't let the things in the past uh, throw you off course or get you out of stride. Keep your eye on the goal. Realize that learning the Word of God, living under the basis of the Word of God, is going to bring the high call of God in your life. These things that you might have at the judgment seat of Christ. These crowns, these rewards, these will indicate something. It will indicate that God was able to work in your life. This is the high call of God. Let God work in your life on an individual basis and then on a collective basis. 
We saw the spiritual advantages contrast to the worldly advantages. God works through the spiritual advantages that he has given to us. And so therefore, these things will indicate this high call of God, the prize that he wants you to move toward, will indicate that God was able to work in you, to will and to do of his own good pleasure. That the believer successfully walked in the good works previously ordained by God. That the power of God was able to work mightily in the believer. This was Paul's driving force in the last days of his life. That high call of God. That the course would be finished and that God would be able to to be glorified in and through him. Paul had once stated that it was his objective to finish this course. He stated that objective. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 20, if you want to turn over there right quick, in Acts chapter 20, Acts 20 and verse 22, Now this is one of those, I I really like this one because Paul is out in the Thule's here but he still has a good objective. See, Paul was warned not to go to Jerusalem. Three times he was warned. God the Holy Spirit warned him three times not to go to Jerusalem. But he went anyway. He decided to go on his own. God told him to go to Rome. Paul, you need to go to Rome. I want you in Rome. Well, Paul decided he wanted to go to Jerusalem for the feast. Well, he went. And of course you know the story. I guess you do. He went. Uh, as a matter of fact, the James gang surrounded him when he got there and said, listen, we got some guys that have taken an oath and uh, they need some money to buy some sacrifices. They need some money. They need somebody you know, to get them a ticket to get in. So guess who? We decided, Paul, that you would be the one that would give them the money. Give them the the tribute that they needed. Well, he did. He got arrested. And he spent two years in Caesarea. And then finally, God got him to Rome. He spent two years in Rome. I don't believe that was the initial intent of God to get how to get Paul to Rome. But that eventually he got there and he learned a lot of lessons along the way. And while he was there, guess what? He wrote the prison epistles where we have the bulk of the mystery doctrines of the church. So God turned the cursing into blessing. But anyway, verse 22 says, And now behold, bound in spirit, and this is not the spirit of God, this is his own spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and affliction await me. Uh, Paul sort of has a martyr complex here. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish my course. Well, that's at least, Paul, you want to finish the course. You're just kind of taking a detour at this particular point. Finish the course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Well, when he went to Jerusalem, no one wanted to hear the gospel. As a matter of fact, they had him thrown in prison. But that's another story. Now, Finally, in 68 A.D., he would be able to say, as he reviewed his life, as we read earlier, well, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am ready, for my, I am already poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. 
However, not only to me, but to all of those who have loved his appearing. That is, when we will be with him and when we will be like him. Isn't that our desire? Of course it is. So therefore, here's the bottom line. Therefore, maintaining momentum mentality is a great challenge for all of us in the time in which we live. And in order to make a maximum impact for the Lord Jesus Christ in this phase of the angelic conflict, God now calls you and calls me. God is calling his resistance force to stand forward, to stand firm, and to stand fearlessly for the principles of the Word of God. We must take a stand, and we must be strong. And I told you at the beginning, please don't underestimate the power of your own personal spiritual life in the angelic conflict. The angels are watching. The angels are looking out of heaven, out of the windows of heaven. They're watching you, by the way. You're on a stage. You're in a theater. And the angels are watching because they want to learn more about the manifold wisdom of God. So the question is tonight, as the angels watch us, are they learning about the wisdom of God in calling out the church, forming the royal family of God, leaving us here to stand in for Christ? Are they learning the manifold wisdom of God, or are they going, are we maintaining our spiritual momentum in this particular point, at this particular time, in the history of your life, what you're having to face, in the life of the nation that we're all having to face, in the world which we're all having to face, don't underestimate your importance as an individual single believer. In Ecclesiastes, there was a pivot of one man that saved a whole city. The wisdom of one man saved an entire city. Please don't underestimate. Don't underestimate how God can use 7,000 in a nation. Remember Elijah? Elijah, I have 7,000 that you know nothing about. He used those 7,000 in the next chapter or so above, uh, over to win the war, by the way. What about the 300? What about Gideon's 300? 32,000? Nah, 300. And not only that, but we're going to give them a torch. <laughs> we're going to give them a, a bugle, a trumpet, and we're going to give them a clay pot. And we're going to send them out against the enemy. Don't underestimate what God can do in your life and in my life and in the life of your local church in preserving Client Nation America. Don't allow, let's don't allow Satan, his parameters, to gain control in our own life. Stick to our knitting. Keep on keeping on and keep on swimming. Having that mentality Maintaining that momentum mentality. Well, we've already seen it, haven't we? Starting out here with the Apostle Paul. Listen, keep on. Keep on pressing on. Forgetting what's behind. Just move forward. Stress forward, he said. Toward the goal. Press on toward that goal. Well, Paul summed it up like this. Whatever you face in your life, Whatever comes your way tomorrow, whatever is facing you tonight before, you know, you close your eyes to go to sleep. I don't know. I hope it'll be all pleasant and pleasant dreams. It may, it may not be. And tomorrow will be another day. But the challenge of maintaining your momentum is occupation with the person of Christ. Listen to what Paul says. He sums it up sort of like this in Philippians 4 and verse 8. Always like I love this word, finally. People say, yeah, I like that word too, finally. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any virtue, and there is, if there is anything worthy of praise, and there is, then let your mind 
dwell on these things. Paul just described for us the concept of being occupied with our Lord Jesus Christ. Being occupied with the grace provisions that God has given to us so that we can keep on moving toward the goal of honoring our Lord Jesus Christ, bringing honor and glory for Him, and becoming part of the, uh, effectively, becoming part of an, the effective part of that uh, resistance force against Satan, as he, of course, keeps on to- moving toward his global agenda. Well, this is the function of the Christ-centered life. Paul just said in, in Philippians 4.8, This is the function of the Christ-centered life. It is the focus on the ultimate problem-solving device of occupation with the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this becomes God's program for maintaining our momentum mentality. All right, let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for these things that you've given us in your word. It is so easy for us to become so distracted with the things around us, to be caught up in so much of the details that we lose sight of our spiritual advantages. We pray that God the Holy Spirit would use the things that we've considered tonight to challenge us to keep moving toward that goal, toward that high call of God in Christ Jesus, which is to finish that course, to move into spiritual maturity, live that spiritual life that you have provided for us, reach that super grace goal, and be able to honor Christ to the maximum. May God the Holy Spirit use these things in our life to cause us and to challenge us to walk and to order our lives in a manner that would be worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. This we ask in His name. Amen. I would thank you very much.